Thanks for the unfailing support. Here, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to all these parties. Thank you. Questions. Question one, Mr. Ambrose Lam. Thank you, President. There are views pointing out that for the new term, government to achieve good governance and to achieve smooth implementation of policies and effective resolution of the deep-rooted social problems in Hong Kong, various government departments need to collaborate with various social organizations so as to jointly work for the development, business opportunities and the well-being of the people. In this connection with the government informed this council, one, given that the incumbent chief executive advocated when running for the election a result-oriented vision in policy implementation, whether the current term government has adopted such a vision in policy implementation. If so, how various government departments collaborate with various social organizations to jointly promote the adoption of such a vision in policy implementation. If not, whether the current government is still retaining the positive non-interventionist policy. Two, whether the government has conducted relevant studies on issues relating to collaboration of social organizations with a view to tying in with national development and implementing reforms that keep abreast of the time. If so, of the details, including the government departments responsible for conducting the studies and implementing the reforms, if not the reasons for that. And three, given the long time and considerable amount of resources required for a legislative proposal to become a law, whether various government departments and social organizations have put in place collaborative mechanisms at present for the effective implementation of new legislation, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Secretary for Home and Youth Affairs. President, the chief executive emphasizes that the new term government will adopt a result-oriented approach to policy implementation and unite all sectors with a view to proactively resolving social problems in the best interests of Hong Kong people. The next five years will be a crucial time for Hong Kong to advance from stability to prosperity. The government will rise to the challenges ahead and collaborate with social organizations to take forward formulate and implement policies that are conducive to Hong Kong's social, econ uh, social development, economy and people's livelihood. My consolidated reply to the question raised by Mr. Ambrose Lam is as follows. One, taking forward the policies under their respective purviews in collaboration with stakeholders and social organizations by adopting a results-oriented approach is a mission that should be carried out by all government departments. Collaboration with social organizations should not be confined to any stage of the policy formulation process. In the early stage of form policy formulation, as well as during and after policy formulation, government departments shall work with social organizations in a manner that suits the needs in their respective areas of work to achieve the objectives of the policies and initiatives. To promote youth development, the Home and Youth Affairs Bureau has been collaborating with the Youth Development Commission, YDC, to launch various thematic funding schemes covering areas such as youth internship and exchange, as well as youth entrepreneurship to sponsor non-governmental organizations and NGOs to organize activities. In the course of formulating the youth development blueprints and youth policy, the current term government will certainly consult stakeholders such as youth organizations to understand their thoughts and views to ensure that the blueprint addresses the need of youth promptly. Meanwhile, the government will continue to maintain close liaison of young people and other stakeholders through various platforms such as the YDC and the districts hear the voices, keep bilateral exchange as well as incorporating their views in the course of policy formulation. For example, on the social welfare front, several coordinating committees are set up under each district social welfare office, DSWO, of the Social Welfare Department, SWD, with members drawn from government departments, welfare, NGOs, local organizations, and professionals, etc. Through these committees, district social welfare officers can assess district needs, foster cross sectoral and multidisciplinary collaboration at the district level and coordinate the implementation of services for local residents, particularly the vulnerable and disadvantaged. In addition, DSWOs prioritize the service needs and foster cross-sectoral and cross-service collaboration in the districts through the local cross-service district welfare coordination mechanism. District welfare planning or forums are also organized on a regular basis to collect views on district needs from various sectors for mapping out the overall district welfare fair strategies. In respect of tying in with national development and implementing policies and reform that keep abreast of the time, the government has been maintaining communication and liaison with social organizations to explore how Hong Kong can better grasp the opportunities brought about by national development and proactively integrate into the national development. As regards tying with 
tying in with the uh, national developments, taking the development of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area GBA as an example, when studying with the national authorities in uh, formulating GBA facilitation measures benefiting Hong Kong, relevant government departments will maintain communication liaison with different sectors and listen to the views on how to better grasp the opportunities brought about by national development. For example, regarding the financial industry, the government and the GBA Youth Community Foundation Co uh, GBA Homeland uh, Youth Fun Community Foundation co-organized that sale for GBA scheme for financial leaders of tomorrow, allowing businesses leaders to directly interact with young people in Hong Kong so as to prepare them for future career development and reach their potential in GBA. In respect of architectural and engineering related uh, professions, government has also introduced uh, to the reference stakeholders facilitation measures. On the education front, the government will explore with the Hong Kong Special Schools Council on how to enhance the professional sharing between the special schools in Hong Kong and the GBA. On environmental protection, the government has been working with the Hong Kong Trade Development Council in organizing the Eco Expo Asia to create business opportunities for the environmental trade organizations. And the uh, power soon to our countries for target to achieve peak carbon m emissions between before 2030 and carbon neutrality before 2060. The recent years. Events have been focusing on exploring and promoting the latest decarbonization strategies and technologies in order to help Hong Kong and other cities in GBA to grasp the business opportunities. As for testing and certification, government follows a sector-led and market-oriented approach to actively assist testing and certification organizations in exploring their participation in the voluntary GBA certification scheme. In the process of implementing policies and reforms that keep abreast of time, the government strives to join hands of social organizations to promote the development of different sectors and maintain the international competitiveness of Hong Kong. For instance, to facilitate business and enhance Hong Kong's international status, the Security Bureau and the Immigration Department have just launched a pilot scheme under the scheme immigration certificate uh, facilitation is provided through uh, collaboration between the government and the community to eligible uh, visitors invited by host org organizations for joining short-term activities in Hong Kong. The government will also maintain close liaison collaboration with trade associations and stakeholders in uh, individual sectors. Uh, to tap their dis uh, suggestions on development uh, st uh, strategies. The government works with healthcare professional bodies in examining the prevailing registration mechanisms and training requirements with a view to meeting the actual needs of the rest relevant professions. On the livelihood and district fronts, the government also attaches great importance to the participation of social organizations when implementing policies that keep abreast of time. In reviewing the policies, implementation, arrangement, and streamlining measures related to development, the Development Bureau will closely liaise with the relevant professional bodies and trade associations and formulate and enhance the implementation details from the perspective of users by gauging the views of stakeholders to ensure effective measures are in place. The Task Force on Transitional Housing and the Housing Bureau provides one-stop coordinated approach and access a communication conduit to facilitate discussions among NGOs and relevant government departments to resolve various problems encountered. To promote the development of district-based primary healthcare, the government is progressively setting up district health center centers operated by NGOs in the 80 districts. The government will unite with the, the community and with the concerted efforts of the government, the community, and individuals work in earnest and with one heart. In the course of enacting legislation, the government will definitely and collaborate with social organizations and listen to the views of the reference sectors in order to implement new legislation effectively. When formulating the legislative framework of the tenancy control and subdivided units, the government had taken into account the recommendations put forward by the task force for the study on tenancy control of subdivided units. The task force had organized a number of public forums and online meetings to gauge the views of members of the public and concerned groups. Also, the government has engaged NGOs to set up six district service teams to supplement the efforts of the rating and valuation department in promoting the new legislation district level and handling general inquiries. In June 2017, SWD set up the working group on the review of ordinances and codes of practice for residential care homes, which comprise members from NGOs and private organizations operating residential care homes, RCH, academics, service users, carers, independent members and representatives from the Hong Kong Council of Social Service. To take forward the aforementioned uh, legislative proposals on the residential care homes elderly persons ordinance and the residential care homes persons with disabilities organized recommended by the Wrecking Group, the government has organized various engagement sessions with stakeholders of the RCH sector to introduce the proposals to them and listen to their views. In fact, the, these are just some of the examples of government's collaboration with social organizations. The Undersecretary for Labor and Welfare and I stand ready to provide further information to members on supplementary questions. Uh, uh, to members supplementary questions. Thank you. Mr. Ambrose Lamb. My question was 
how the government and social organizations could collaborate to implement legislation. So the key word is implement. The government's uh, first reply is that uh, the government ha is um, result driven. Then um, it is the mission for all government departments to uh, formulate policies in collaboration with social organizations. So the reply is the government is still just going by its own way. Now, I in the whole main reply, uh, it, it all keeps saying that the government will listen to views, but I don't want the government just to listen to views and then keep to its own position. Now, for social welfare issues, you will work with uh, social welfare groups, but then for um, GBA development, uh, youth development, healthcare, environmental uh, issues, and so on, the government would just uh, listen to views. It would just keep conducting consultation exercises. In other words, over the years, the government has not been working with uh, social organizations to formulate and implement policies. The government keeps uh, uh, holding consultations and talks. Uh, it, see, uh, it thinks it's done much, but actually it's out of touch with uh, reality. By being down to earth in your in your you're working with social organization, you should work with the organization. You should you shouldn't just listen to views and that's it. Mr. Ambrose Lang, please come to your supplementary question. President. Now in the new government, is there any particular department responsible for studying reforms on the government's collaboration with social organizations. Secretary, now in my ring reply, I mentioned that uh, well, the for new government adopts a result-oriented approach. So when we formulate uh, every policy, we must uh, collaborate with um, social organizations and stakeholders. So this is the most important for each uh, policy bureau. And in the main reply, I've quoted many examples. Uh, but because uh, we don't have enough time, so we can't really give you all the details. You know, for these schemes or um, le legislation, how we actually work with social organizations to implement uh, these m uh, policies and m legislation. It's not as Mr. Ambrose Lamb put it, that we just listen to views when formulating policies. Actually, when it comes to implementation, we do work with social organizations. For example, um, under the Home and Youth Affairs Group, we have a number of uh, uh, youth intern schemes, or, uh, internship schemes on the mainland, youth exchange schemes, uh, funding schemes, and so on. So we are working through uh, social organizations to implement these schemes and also to identify. Uh, we also identify suitable organizations to take part in our schemes. And then under the Home and Affairs Bureau, we also have uh, various uh, area committees, uh, uh, district fight crime committees, district uh, fire safety committees, and um, so on. So we, there are many so, um, district organizations that help with the implementation of policies and initiatives. So you can rest assured, we don't just listen to views. When we form, uh, you know, formulate a policy, we actually take on board views expressed. And when we implement the policy, we will work together with social organizations. Thank you. Dr. Tik Chi Yun. Social organizations or civic community, you know, um, they've been actively pro uh, participating in Hong Kong's development and promoting its development. Some groups are concerned about the elderly, persons with disabilities, the um, disadvantage and so on. Many of their service targets, uh, their members are mostly uh, service users, so they know exactly what they the, what their seven needs are. Now the secretary said that there may be opportunities for these groups to be involved, but then uh, for many groups that we're in contact with, they tell us that uh, it's very difficult for them to communicate with government officials or to take be involved. So to step up collaboration with uh, these organizations, would the government uh, set a certain ratio on various uh, committees so that uh, these groups are able to take part in the discussion process? And then the, the government will, will also be able to hear the views of these service users. Secretary. Thank you, President. I'm grateful to Dr. Tixi Yun for his views. Now, for the different policy bureau and departments, When we, uh, when we um, try to identify suitable persons to be appointed to different 
committees. We will consider uh, first, uh, you know, uh, on the one hand, stakeholders, that is those in the sectors, and on the other uh, hand, uh, lay members. Uh, so with lay members, we will consider representatives of uh, reference social organizations to join these committees. But anyway, I've heard members, the members' view. When we uh, decide on the uh, membership of a committee, we would definitely make sure it's uh, more representative. Mr. Andrew Lam. Now, we know very well, having heard the secretary, Hong Kong um, is a pluralistic society, and there are many different social functions. I never doubt the government's um, commitment to um, seek the help of different social organizations to promote their policies. But then, uh, say, on uh, the fight against the epidemic, we can see The government has not been, you know, doing a good job in uh, asking social organizations to help in the fight against the epidemic, if I could put it that way. Uh, I think that happens because the um, different departments do not know exactly uh, what the social functions are of these various organizations, and so they don't know how to coordinate these organizations so they could help the government. Now, unless you don't agree to this analysis, but whether you agree or not, what I want to know is that uh, in the coming days and months, how could the government make use of a better structure or even technology so you will have a full understanding of the functions of different social organizations and you know how they could uh, contribute? And how can you help um, the organic um, development of different social organizations? Because in the end, that will help the development of Hong Kong. Secretary. Thank you for the question. Now, the mention members our fight against the epidemic during the fifth wave of the epidemic. Actually, you might have noticed that we did rely on uh, different uh, social organizations to help with uh, our anti-epidemic effort at the district level. For example, the distribution of the anti-epidemic pack. Now, we are talking about the distribution of a huge number of packs, and we, uh, were, we are most grateful to all volunteers who helped in this effort. And then we've also, um, you know, learned from this experience. Now, in the SE's election manifesto, uh, he uh, has uh, committed to setting up um, the district care teams uh, the, in the 18 districts. So we will learn from our past experience. We will see how we could uh, make use of uh, the resources of different um, social con organizations as well as their connections and the manpower resources so we could together um, take uh, care better for our com uh, districts. Now, so for the Home and Youth Affairs Bureau, we are responsible for setting up these district uh, care teams, but then for different policy bureaus, I'm sure uh, they know that they could make use of um, the resources of the relevant social organizations when formulating their policies. For example, the Development Bureau is now looking at streamlining land development process. Definitely, it will talk to the relevant social organizations and listen to their views. So I can tell members this. First, we will definitely find out the resources, the manpower, or the connections that um, social organizations have and that they could share with us. And then, uh, and then we will then uh, make good use of such experience. Mr. Michael Locke, thank you. Uh, strengthening collaboration between the government and the social organizations is an important element in enhancing governance from uh, um, consultation to implementation of policies there is need for collaboration with social organizations and I'm sure we all know that but then from my own experience I see that uh, government really did not um, uh, uh, care enough about um, the views of uh, local organizations such as units and so on. 
But uh, I'm sure Miss um, Alice Mack knows very well that um, local groups could play an important role. Now, the, uh, Miss, um, the secretary said that uh, the, the, there will be district care teams set up for the 18 districts. That's good. But uh, would you have resources? And will you invite um, the you know, local uh, organizations such as uh, unions and so on to uh, help you, to join you in this effort? Mr. Secretary, now we have, uh, as I've said in the reply, we will make a use of the experience we have and uh, you know apply it to the setting of the 18 district care teams. We are still working on the details and we welcome views from members on how we should form uh, and operate these uh, teams. So that's exactly how we will um, in, um, seek views from the, the reference sectors when formulating policy. So this is a good example. But then, um, you know, the purpose of setting up the district care teams, is, uh, as some members pointed out, uh, is because um, during the fight against the epidemic, we could see that uh, um, community groups could offer immense support to the government because uh, these groups have their own connections and resources they could uh, work with the government in a systematic manner. And so now this is the whole purpose of setting up the district care teams, and we welcome views from members. Thank you. Question two, uh, Ms. Chen Yutming. Thank you, President. In the Waste Blueprint uh, for Hong Kong 2035 announced uh, early last year, the government set a long-term goal of developing adequate waste to energy facilities so as to move away from the reliance on landfills for disposal of municipal solid waste or MSW and achieve zero landfill in around 2035. However, Hong Kong currently disposes of an average daily total of 11,000 tons of MSW through two existing landfills, whereas the integrated waste management facilities or the incineration facilities phase one and Phase 2 under the blueprint, which will commence operation in 2025 and the early 2030s respectively, will only be able to dispose of a daily total of around 7,000 tonnes of MSW. Therefore, the government currently still needs to identify sites for the construction of Phase 3 of the incineration facilities and to extend these landfills during the transitional period. In this connection, will the government inform this council 1, as Phase 3 of the incineration facilities is currently still at the site search stage, how the government ensures that the target of zero landfill can be achieved in 2035, whether it will take new measures and allocate additional resources to advance the completion of phase one and two of this incineration facilities, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. Two, whether it has reserved expansion space for phases one and two of the incineration facilities for raising their waste disposal capac capacity, if so, of the details, if not the reasons for that. And three, as it is learned that residents in Luohu District and Nanshan District of Shenzhen have incessant grievances towards the northeast New Territories landfill and the west New Territories landfill, whether the government has plans to review afresh the operations of these two landfills, such as deferring their extension plans or examining when they can be closed, if so, of the details have not the reasons for that. Secretary for Environment and Ecology. President, last year, the government announced the, the Waste Blueprint for Hong Kong 2035 and the Hong Kong Climate Action Plan 2050, setting out to move away from the reliance on landfills for municipal solid waste or MSW disposal by around 2035 and to achieve carbon neutrality in waste management before 2050. The government strategy has two main directions. The first is to proactively mobilize the entire community to practice waste redux reduction and resource circulation to, so as to reduce waste at source. The second is to move away from the reliance on landfill for for MSW disposal through construction of infrastructure and expedite de the development of sufficient waste to energy facilities. Our reply to the question raised by Ms. Chen is as follows. One and two, the government is building the first integrated waste management facility or IWMF, namely I Park One, on an artificial island of about 16 hectares in the open sea of Sheku Chow, 
with a treatment capacity of 3,000 tons of, of MSW per day. The relevant reclamation works and construction works for seawalls and breakwaters have been substantially completed. The contractor is carrying out the foundation works on the artificial island and also prefabricating the boiler steel structure and its electric, electrical and mechanical parts at the prefabrication yard in Zhuhai. The prefabricated items will then be shipped to the artificial island for assembly, while the remaining works for the project will be continued. IPART 1 is expected to commission in 2025. The government announced in January this year that the Zhangzhou Middle Ash Lagoon in Chinwun was identified to be the site for developing the second IWMF, i.e. the Integrated Waste Management Facility Phase 2 to be named as IPAC 2 with a daily treatment capacity of 4,000 tons of MSW. When planning for the development of IPAC 1, the government considered both Zhangzhou in Chinwun and the artificial island of Jekku Chao were suitable sites for developing waste to energy facilities. Comparing with other locations in Hong Kong, the conditions of the Zhangzhou site in Chinwun are relatively mature for developing waste to uh, energy facilities. This will be conducive to the expeditious commencement and completion of the construction works for IPAC 2. We expect that IPAC 2 can be put into services no later than early 2030s to further reduce the use of landfill space for MSW disposal. The Environmental Protection Department, or EPD, is now arranging for the engagement of consultants to carry out a detailed environmental impact assessment study and the technical studies for IPARC 2. The consultancy studies are expected to commence in December this year. Our goal is to achieve zero landfill by around 2035 through various waste reduction and recycling measures, coupling with adequate waste to, waste to energy facilities so as to cope with the long-term needs for MSW management of Hong Kong. The amount of waste generation will increase with the economic and trade and population goals growth. Currently, we expect that in addition, in addition to IPAC 1 and 2, it is most likely that IPAC 3 uh, will be required in order to achieve the goal. Therefore, EPD is now commencing a territory-wide site search study in parallel to identify other potential sites suitable for developing more similar waste to energy facilities. For timely completion and operation of adequate waste to energy facilities required for Hong Kong, we are exploring the use of public-private partnership approach to pursue some of these facilities to ensure speedy construction of waste to energy facilities through the most efficient and cost-effective means. Regarding the suggestion on increasing the design treatment capacity of IPARC 1, the area of the artificial island of Shekku Chow is only sufficient for building an IWMF with a daily treatment capacity of 3,000 tons and the current design has already occupied the whole artificial island. Therefore, it is technically not feasible to increase the treatment capacity of IPARC 1. As for IPARC 2, where Zhangzhou on in Chunwen overlooking Deep Bay, both sides of the site have been developed with other existing facilities given the geographical constraints. Together with the surrounding facilities, the site area available for development is limited, which is estimated uh, to be merely enough, enough for building the proposed uh, main facility with a daily treatment capacity of 4,000 tons and its ancillary facilities, and there is virtually no space for further expansion. Third. Nowadays, Hong Kong needs to handle about 11,000 tons of MSW and 4,000 tons of construction waste every day. Currently, the Northeast New Territories or NENT landfill and the West uh, New Territories or WENT landfill are responsible for receiving MSW. The government is actively promoting the development of waste to energy facilities according to the strategy set out in the Waste Blueprint for Hong Kong 2035 with a view of uh, with a view to achieving the goal of a zero landfill by around 2035. However, before the full commissioning of adequate waste to energy facilities, Hong Kong still needs to have landfills for disposal of MSW. Therefore, it is necessary to extend the landfills to a limited extent during the transitional period and to increase the capacity of the existing landfills to cope with the disposal needs in the short to medium term. With the anticipated commissioning of IPAC 1 and one in 2025. Together with the landfill operation arrangements and associated traffic arrangements, it is expected that the total amount of, of MSW to be handled by the two landfills in the new territories can be reduced uh, by around uh, 3,000 tons per day. Upon the commissioning of IPARC 2, the NENT landfill will completely cease receiving MSW. By then, the development of the northern metropolis may generate a large amount of construction waste, which will not decay and be odorless. If construction waste will be disposed of 
at the nearby NENT landfill during the development of the northern metropolis, it can reduce the nuisance to residents caused by the long-distance transportation, while the odour and hygiene problems arising from landfilling of MSW will no longer exist. Around 2035, when Hong Kong has sufficient waste incineration capacity, the WENT landfill will also cease receiving MSW. Regionally, EPD has all along been actively maintaining close communication and exchanging views with the Shenzhen Municipal Government on the operational management of the NENT landfill and WENT landfill and their extensions. Shenzhen and Hong Kong sites will continue to maintain close liaison regarding issues associated with the two landfills. Thank you. Ms. Chen Yutmeng. Well, uh, Secretary, in your reply, you said that uh, both Shenzhen and Hong Kong will maintain close liaison regarding issues associated with the two landfills. All right. Uh, this is uh, the pic these are the pictures sent to me by netizen uh, in Shenzhen. And, um, the landfill is right next to residential development. It's just two kilometers from down, from the town center. So it's not just uh, affecting them. It's also hurting the residents in Takuling. It's also hurting their emotions or feeling about Hong Kong people. That is uh, the uh, Shenzhen residents. So um, there are factors uh, affecting the um, the relationship between this and the C's reply was positive, and re in recent days, I've also received a lot of um, comments. Um, over a thousand complaints have been received, and I'll be sending them to you in a couple of days. What, with regard to the pollution caused by the landfills, some 200,000 residents uh, on both sides uh, of the border have been affected. So will you be listening to their views so as to improve people's livelihood? And would you propose that uh, the incineration facility should be completed as soon as possible? Secretary. President, we fully understand the sentiments of the residents with regard to the nuisance caused by the landfills. We understand that uh, there are concerns, and also for Shenzhen residents, um, they are also very concerned about this. So, as I said in the main reply just now, well, in Shenzhen, we have been maintaining very close uh, communication with the municipal government. It's not just about uh, the residents uh, on both sides who are very concerned about this. We have also taken a series of measures in order to improve the NENT's uh, operational standards. I can give you some examples. For example, well, we have reduced the size of the landfills, and also rec on a regular basis, we would also be spraying uh, deodorant uh, sprays in order to reduce the uh, odor problem. And also in accordance with uh, the latest international standards and experience, uh, we would also um, improve the, um, the craftsmanship at the landfill in order to reduce odor. We have also increased manpower so that um, we would conduct uh, regular inspection of the landfill in order to uh, uh, repair the uh, damaged uh, parts of the landfill, and the operational hours have also been reduced uh, on a daily basis. Instead of working till, well, we would uh, cease uh, receiving MSW at 6 p.m. every day, and also within the operation area. We have also got some um, organic pools, uh, which can also help reduce uh, odor. We have also uh, got um, enclosed uh, operations in order to reduce uh, odor. So we have taken proactive measures to reduce the problem. And I personally I also am also very concerned about their views, and therefore our colleagues would also be taking follow-up measures uh, or actions to see how effective they have been. And if uh, you have any uh, comments to make, you can also contact me personally. Yes, uh, Mr. Chow Siu Chong, President, um, the NENT landfill has caused um, a lot of um, older nuisance uh, to the low wall and also Shenzhen residents. And in recent years, the problem has deteriorated. Even I personally have received uh, some feedback from Shenzhen residents hoping that the SR government can do something concrete to improve the situation. And as said just now, well, the uh, Bureau and the Department have been uh, liaising closely with the Shenzhen Municipal Government, and yet uh, the problem is getting worse. So the CE said that uh, he would adopt a target-oriented approach. So I hope that something concrete can be done in order to improve the situation. So my question for the Secretary is this. In monitoring the performance of the contractors, have you done enough? So can you tell us? Okay, for this operator, 
would he act in accordance with the contract signed with us so that um, on a daily basis with regard to the um, garbage um, disposed of at the landfill, would they be covered? And also for areas outside of the landfill, you will have to enclose it. So have they done a good job? So will there be any problems that have not been identified? So I hope that you can do a better job. Thank you. Secretary, President, as I said earlier, we are making efforts in improving the operation of the NENT landfill. A series of measures have been introduced. And of course, uh, the honorable member was suggesting that we should do a better job in terms of our monitoring uh, efforts. Yes, uh, there are two things that we have been doing. Under the contract, uh, we do have resident site staff from the um, EPD who will act in accordance with the contract and they will conduct daily inspection. Um, on site uh, to see if the contractor has uh, acted in full accordance with the contractual terms. And uh, secondly, well, in accordance with the laws of Hong Kong, we would also monitor the performance of the contractor to see if there is any leakage of uh, sewage or odor um, generated uh, from the uh, site. And uh, if there are, then uh, we would prosecute them accordingly. And indeed, there have been prosecution cases. So we would not relax our efforts. We will strictly monitor the performance of the contractor. Yes, Sir Chu Kwok Kang. Thank you, President. Uh, well, for the existing landfills in Hong Kong, they are causing a lot of environmental pollution affecting the residents' health. This is um, a hard fact. And if the administration says that uh, it's still in line with the standards and a lot of measures have been put in place, uh, I think you're deceiving yourself. Uh, well, Takuling is an important development area. It's no longer suitable for a landfill to be located there. So will you consider relocating the landfill instead of using the uh, tackling as the landfill site, and so uh, how can you expedite the construction of the uh, incineration facility? Thank you, President. As I said in the main reply, we are of the view that the best uh, way to deal with it is to adopt a two-pronged approach. Number one, we have to reduce waste at source. So we have worked uh, very hard uh, to reduce uh, waste collection, and secondly. We would also be expediting the construction of the waste to energy facility, for example, for IPARC 1. It will be completed um, in 2025. And for IPARC 2, we are actually pressing ahead with this, uh, and we expect that uh, to be completed um, in the early 2030s. And then for IPARC 3, we are also trying to uh, identify the suitable site. And from the time when we try to identify the site uh, to the completion of the facility, according to our past experience, uh, well, uh, 2035 uh, would be um, quite difficult to achieve, and therefore we are adopting a new approach. For example, we would be prepared to adopt the public-private partnership approach. For example, once we identify the site, if we are able to engage the private sector in the construction, then at least uh, in the early stage, we'd be able to reduce a lot of uh, red tape uh, and bureaucracy within the government so that we can expedite the construction. We believe that that is the most efficient way to reduce uh, the use of uh, landfill in receiving MSW. Thank you. Next, uh, Kenneth Lau. Thank you, President. I have to declare interest because um, I'm the ind indigenous um, residence uh, representative from um, from that area. So, um, Takuleng Northeast uh, and also Chiang Kuan uh, uh, Southeast and also Long Ku Tan. And in 2030, uh, the landfill will be saturated, and therefore the administration is now considering disposing uh, MSW in another form so so that you can compact it uh, and reduce the size. And then by the 2030s, you'll be um, moving away from relying on the uh, landfills. And you are also going to build uh, IPARC 2 in uh, Zhangzhou. And also, Shekku Chao would also be used to build uh, IPARC 1 and 2. So you're actually owing Tun Moon and also Long Ku Tan residents something because uh, the these are uh, um, obnoxious uh, facilities have always been placed in NT West, and you spent over ten billion dollars to expand the landfills. And uh, precisely, all right, um, you expanded the facility by 125 kilometers, and of course, I have uh, high hopes uh, on the new term of the administration, and I'm sure. The secretary would be doing something 
concrete. But then the fact that uh, we are surrounded uh, by waste, and I think uh, waste energy is the best idea. So will you be bold in enacting legislation to ban the use of plastic um, cook, uh, well, um, uh, table um, ware? Because uh, fast food uh, is very commonplace these days, uh, and therefore the use of uh, such um, tableware has increased by 30%. So will you be reviewing the situation comprehensively? Secretary, yes, thank you for the question. I'd like to spend some time on this. We are also, we are actually developing waste to energy facility and given the uh, latest uh, technology, it should no longer be treated uh, as obnoxious facility. It's not just about the technology because it will no longer generate uh, odor or cause any damage to health. In fact, in terms of the design, in many places, they have been designed into something that look nice. And it can also integrate uh, with uh, local or even recreational facilities. And in overseas countries, we have already got ample examples. In Hong Kong, we also have one. That is uh, in Tin Mun Chang Choi. We have also got the uh, iPark uh, one. It's been used uh, to incinerate the um, the uh, contaminated soil from sewage treatment plant is a lot more polluted. But then if you've been there, you can see that it looks really nice. Uh, and there's um, even spa facilities uh, for the residents. And they have been very popular with, with the residents. So we will be adopting that approach in developing future waste to energy facilities. I'm sure that would help allay a lot of the concerns of the uh, residents. And also in developing IPARC2 in Zhangzhou, there will also be a lot of uh, recreational facilities uh, for the enjoyment by the residents. I'm sure they will be well received. And also on the use of uh, plastic uh, tableware and so on, will you uh, face them out? Huh? Yes. Uh, the answer is in the positive. We are actually drafting legislative proposals uh, how we can regulate uh, more stringently on the use of plastic uh, 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 or one-off um, tableware. So we will be uh, presenting the legislation to you uh, before the end of the year. Thank you. Um, Gary Chen. President, uh, before transporting the MSW to the landfill, we will have to transport it uh, to the refuse uh, transfer station before compacting it and compressing it uh, for transfer to the uh, landfill. I'd like to say that uh, out of the 13 RTS, and uh, you can see where they are located, you can see that 11 are located um, in the outlying islands and Kowloon and so on. They are transported uh, to um, the uh, landfills uh, by sea. And yet, um, there are two in Sha Tin and NT West. Um, these are refuse transfer station. The garbage uh, is transported uh, to the landfills uh, uh, by la on, on land. So the problem is for the Sha Tin RTS, uh, on average, some 400 uh, trips are made by the refuse transfer vehicles, uh, and then about uh, Four, uh, and about 700 uh, container uh, vehicles are transporting the uh, garbage to landfills, and they'll pass through Tolo Highway and also our urban area, causing secondary pollution. And then for the Sha Tin RTS, it's been in use for 28 years. Secretary, I'd like to ask you, for such a, land, for such a transfer by land route, uh, can it be changed uh, to uh, transfer by sea, and also for the Sha Tin RTS, can it be redeveloped or relocated elsewhere? Thank you. Secretary. President, with regard to the RTS, the idea is that, um, well, um, at different locations, uh, we set up um, refuse collection points, and then for domestic ways, uh, the um, refuse collection uh, trucks uh, would be relatively dirty. And then by the time when they have gone into the RTS, uh, and then once they are out, uh, it's been compacted and compressed. So basically, it's containerized, and it will no longer cause any pollution. And therefore, in this regard, uh, our main consideration is uh, where we should be positioning these um, RTS so that uh, the entire district can see less nuisance and less pollution. The, route, the issue that you raised earlier, that is about whether or not we will review the location of the Sha Tin RTS, the answer is in the positive. Well, after the completion of um, new waste to energy facilities, because the location has changed, and we believe that 
Many of them are located uh, at waterfront, and therefore the distribution of uh, LTS would also need to be uh, reviewed. But then uh, to change the location of the LTS uh, would take time and design. So we need time to look into it. Well, question number four, three, the Honorable Lydian Kuo. Thank you, President. Your government has for five consecutive years since 2019 rolled out a one of measure to pay examination fees for school candidates sitting the Hong Kong Diploma or Secondary Education Examination, Hong Kong DSE. It is learned that the measure is widely welcomed by school candidates and schools. In this connection, will the government inform this council, one, given that when attending the meeting of the Finance Committee, FC, of this council on the 31st of May 2019, the then Under Secretary for Education indicated then that the authorities uh, would consider the suggestion of regularizing the payment of examination fees for school candidates sitting Hong Kong DSE in the context of a comprehensive review of the operation mode and financial structure of the Hong Kong Examinations and uh, Assessment Authority, HKEAA, and that the Education Bureau envisaged that the authorities would put forward specific proposals in about two years upon commencement of the review to seek the views of FC members and stakeholders on such proposals, with a target of completing the review within the subsequent two years of the details of the relevant proposals and the current progress of the relevant work. Two, whether it would consider according priority to regularizing the payment of examination fees for those Hong Kong DSC school candidates with financial difficulties, such as the beneficiaries of school textbook assistance scheme, the Comprehensive Social Security Assistance Scheme and the Community Care Fund Assistance Programs, if so, of the details. And three, in order to fi finish the last mile for free secondary education, whether the government will regularize the payment of examination fees for Hong Kong DSC school candidates, including school candidates who are Hong Kong children study in the mainland cities of the Guangdong, Hong Kong, Macau, Greater Bay Area, if so, of the details. Secretary for Education. President, the Hong Kong Examination and Assessment Authority, Hong Kong EAA, which operates on a self-financing basis, is a statutory body established in 1977 under the Hong Kong Examination and Assessment Authority Ordinance, CAP 261. Its main statutory responsibility is to conduct a specified examination, which currently refers to the Hong Kong Diploma of the Secondary Education Hong Kong DSE examination. It is therefore the HKEAA's primary duty to professionally administer the Hong Kong DSE examination and to provide fair and just assessment for all candidates. In, consider in considering the economic outlook and the financial position of the government at the time, the Financial Secretary announced a number of one-off relief measures in the budgets of 2018-2019 to 2022-2023 which include the proposal to pay the examination fees for school candidates sitting for the 2019 to 2023 Hong Kong DSE examinations. These one-off relief measures were not recurrent subsidy. Our reply to the Honorable Lillian Kwok's question is as follows. One, in an effort to implement the above relief measures in the 2018-19 budget, the Education Bureau EDB sought the approval of the Finance Committee of Lesh Co. in May 2019 for new commitment amounting to $160 million to pay the examination fees for school candidates sitting for the 2020 Hong Kong DSE examination. At the meeting, members of the Finance Committee suggested the regularization of Hong Kong DSE fee waiver. The EDP replied that the suggestion would not only involve a number of important complex policy issues, but also relate to the mode of operation and financial structure of Hong Kong EAA as an independent statutory beauty body, which operated on a self-financing basis under the Hong Kong EAA ordinance. The EDP would consider the suggestion of regular Regularizing Hong Kong DSE review waiver in the long run while conducting the comprehensive review on the mode of operation and financial structure of the Hong Kong EAA. It was envisaged by the EDB that the review will come up with concrete proposals in about two years' time for consultation with members and stakeholders with a view to completing the review in a further two year period. The comprehensive review on the mode of operation of the Finance Committee of Hong Kong EAA has subsequently been completed. At a meeting of the panel on education of LegCo on the 5th of February 2021, the EDB presented the discussion paper titled The Financial Structure of the Hong Kong EAA and the Initial Thoughts on its Long Term Funding Options to Members and sought their views on the long-term funding options of Hong Kong EAA. The EDP pointed out in the electrical paper data the 5th of February 2021 that the examination fee is in general charge on the user pays principle, 
The Hong Kong TSC examination fees collected for the financial year 2019 to 20 could only cover about 55. 33% of the operating cost. The cost of examination and the average examining fees charge of typical candidate taking six subjects in that year were amount to $5,957 and $3,132 respectively, while the shortfall were covered by other income. The Hong Kong EA has been very cautious and prudent in handling the adjustments of Hong Kong TSC exam fees and the substantial cost for the candidates. On the other hand, the additional costs arising from the special arrangements for candidates with special education needs, SAN, is also fully borne by the Hong Kong EAA. Such SCAs, including the provision of special exam centers, special question papers, and serial A's and invigilatory Relation arrangements are to provide a more inclusive environment for SAN candidates. And it is observed that the number of candidates with SAN has doubled from 2011 12 to 2019 20, resulting in a corresponding increase in the expenditure on ESSAs. The current examination fee for SEA candidates is set at the same level as other candidates. To ensure that the candidates of SAN can be equitably assessed under suitable conditions, the legal paper stated that EDB would discuss with the Education Center for the best and most economical ways of subsidizing SEN candidates for attending Hong Kong DSC exams. The Hong Kong EAA will continue to take into account factors such as the Hong Kong EAA's overall financial position costs and resources required for administering the exams, inflation rate, the local economic conditions, and affordability of families in general during the annual review of exam fees adjustments. The EDP will also put in the exam in the application for exam fees adjustment by Hong Kong EAA. Two, the government has different recurrent financial assistance schemes for stu students studying ranging from primary to the post-secondary education levels to ensure that local candidates will not to be deprived of education due to financial difficulties. The financial assistance schemes include the school textbook assistance scheme, the student travel subsidy scheme, the subsidy scheme for internet, internet access charges and exam fee and remission schemes were made to help students with financial needs cover the, their learning expenses. Under the EFRS, uh, school candidates with financial needs sit, sitting for Hong Kong DSE exam may submit application for Hong Kong EA through their attending schools, and Hong Kong EA will confirm the results of the means test on the family of of this student applicant with the Hong Working Family and Student Financial Assistance Agency, WFSFAA. Eligible candidate will be granted full of half fee remission of exam fees according to the family income. In addition, the SWD will provide financial secretary for families receiving CSSAs to subsidize their public exam fees. Uh, the latest uh, payment in 2017 and 2018, the Hong Kong SA DSE examination fee paid by WFS FAA under the EFRS to Hong Kong EAA was about $33 million. The number of students beneficiary was about four. 14,600, uh, among which uh, 8,200 were granted full remission and 6,400 uh, half fee remission. The government has been upholding the principle of prudent financial management to ensure the proper use of public funds. The ETB is committed to providing 12 year free quality education and has been allocating substantial resources to enhance uh, education quality, providing timely uh, support to families with financial uh, needs and alleviate the burdens of pa parents. In addition, the ETB have regularized the payment of student grant. Starting from 2021 school year, all students in secondary day, secondary day schools, primary schools, and special schools, including DSS schools, public sector schools, EFS schools, and private schools, as well as kindergarten, are provided with study grant of $2,500 every year to alleviate parents' burden in defraying ex education expenses. From the perspective of education system, free education doesn't mean that the government should provide all services free. Instead, we would uh, deploy the scarce resources to precisely support students' financial needs. Certain uh, services and items will be charged on a user pay principle or have to be paid by parents, such as uh, textbooks, school uniforms, and lunches, while assistance will be provided by the government for families with financial needs to attain, attain such services or items. The ETB of the, of the wheel, there's no policy justification for charging the examination fee on a user to change the examination uh, of a user pays principle. And such policies should not be changed casually. Uh, as for the proposal to pay examination fee for school candidates, which are Hong Kong students study in the mainland, we cannot, we are, we are not in the position to make a commitment at the moment. I'm very really disappointed at the government's reply. It's not uh, really in line with President C's uh, aspiration for the SAR government to be more proactive and efficient. 
if we regularize the payment of DSC examination fee for students, then we would uh, do away with the current situation where different departments are asking for different things and uh, following different procedures in helping the students. For example, for the travel, uh, some of it's uh, uh, Beneficiary of the uh, student travel subsidy, subsidy scheme cannot be benefited from the fee waiver. The, with the administration, the more the proactive and be committed to helping all, all the uh, DSE uh, examination candidates and uh, unify the procedures so that you pay the exam fees for all of them. This will make uh, the system more efficient and uh, it would make the system much more efficient and it would also provide convenience and uh, facilitation to people's livelihood. So Ms. Kuo has is asking for the regularizing the payment of the Hong Kong DSC exam fees. As I've said, we are providing assistance to, to, through the uh, WFS, FAA and uh, SWD in uh, helping students in needs. They, they, and the students will have to apply through their schools. This is because we want to deploy our resources precisely to help those in need. This system has been in place for a long time and uh, it's been working very smoothly. Uh, Mr. Rock Chen, in answering the question, the secretary refers to ten data in 2019-2020, uh, a student taking six uh, six subjects uh, would be paying school fees amounting to 53% of the actual operating cost. But actually, uh, arranging exams are the statutory buildings of the Hong Kong EAA. As the, the review, the two-year review of the financial structure of Hong Kong EAA has been completed, the secretary has told us so. And now that uh, you know, the, the, what would you do, what proposal would you make to the Hong Kong EAA in terms of uh, the financial uh, structure so that uh, they, would be, uh, they, they would be able to be conducting uh, examination most cost effectively and even be uh, self-financing? Secretary. Uh, in the long run, uh, we would like uh, the Hong Kong EAA to reduce its deficit and to be able to be viable in the long term. In the 2021, in our paper submitted, we uh, suggested that there should be a food and a approach taken to the take, roll out different measures for the longer term financial health. It is uh, estimate, estimated uh, after 2023, the measures uh, would have uh, you results. There are a number of uh, suggestions. First, first of all, cost control and increase uh, revenue for Hong Kong EAA. We are have a, a target set for savings for three financial years. Uh, that is from 2021 to 2023-24. They, they would uh, adopt a 011 uh, budget cut and uh, they would uh, reduce the staff for, for eight uh, regular items. In 2023, they would, they would be able to save six million. In 2023, 2024, they will again save uh, six million dollars. Uh, secondly, adoption of uh, technology to reduce costs and to streamline their procedures. Uh, the use of computer assessment, uh, of online assessment, to, for oral examination and also for AI to, uh, assessment and uh, marking would uh, be introduced. This will not uh, affect the fairness of examination and there will be prior consultation with the education sector. The uh, Hong Kong EAA is not uh, is now uh, assessing its uh, infrastructure and also to uh, in, introduce more international examinations, which may be paper-based, uh, to increase their revenue. Second, the government will provide more support. For example, for SEN students, to ensure that the uh, SEN students will be able to take the uh, examination in a fair environment, the Hong Kong uh, the administration will ha assist them in taking DSA sittings, DSE examination. We would uh, reduce the uh, procedure as far as possible, and we will provide uh, empty school campuses uh, to uh, satisfy their de development needs. 
uh, for example, a Hong Kong school campus uh, was leased to Hong Kong EAA for 10 years so that it can be used as an assessment and examination center. It would result in rental saving and related costs of about eight to $10 million. The Hong Kong EAA will use that center to, in, to, to organize international examination, to explore new business areas, and also to lease uh, the venue to uh, outside bodies for seminars, resulting in additionally $1 million of revenue. The uh, Hong Kong EAA is now tendering out the renovation work of the uh, MT uh, campus. We are going to streamline the procedure. We have uh, accepted the, uh, the the report from the uh, curriculum council for on the uh, streamlining of the assessment of four senior secondary schools. For example, in uh, the, the uh, lib liberal studies uh, stu subject will be replaced by a civil and uh, independent. And that independent research uh, component of the examination will be reduced, and there will be a mainland uh, visits that that would uh, start in the 2022 in form four classes, and some of the examination adjustments have been uh, introduced, resulting in lower costs uh, for, for as for the business development of Hong Kong EAA, and uh, they are carrying out a strategic review of the infrastructure and the equip equipment so that they would be able to uh, organize examination in line with global trend and also to tie to cope with the uh, uncertainty faced uh, brought by the epidemic. The Hong Kong EAA will also embark on capital investment in their information system, the examination platform and uh, infrastructure project where, where it is necessary to refurbish uh, examination examination uh, centers to provide additional uh, uh, computer terminals for more oral examinations, and they would uh, enhance the uh, operation of uh, Hong Kong DSE examination, resulting in future costs. The uh, Education D DB has uh, utilized uh, $366 million approved by FS, and also in, if need, we will provide special funding to Hong Kong EAA to satisfy the, the, their development needs and to make sure that the Hong Kong EA can uh, ensure it's a longer term and healthy growth of the uh, organization. Mr. Benson, no. In the main reply, the secretary uh, explains why uh, the government will not uh, regularize the payment of our examination fee for the candidates. And the main is, is about the user pays principle. Well, what, what, it would be fair if we are able to choose to use the service in question or not. But for uh, secondary uh, schools, uh, taking the DSE examination is a must. Uh, they, they have no choice. So I'm afraid this uh, user pay the principle is really appropriate here. I don't think it's really appropriate here. But paying examination fee for candidates is a move of uh, kindness for their families. In 2023 budget, the annual cost is about $149 million compared with the overall expenditure of the government. It's not a really big sum. So I believe this is, this is in line with prudent financial management principle. My question is, if we are to uh, regularize the payment of exam fees for school candidates, uh, what, what more should, would, would, it be, would be needed to do this? Apart from the user pays a principle so that uh, we can uh, maintain the flexibility in offering the fee waiver and uh, that the government can uh, use the resources for more urgent and need, more urgently needed areas. If we use the, uh, we pay the school fees for, and uh, give the money to the DSC for exam, it would affect uh, the public finance principle and also the Hong Kong EAA as an independent statutory body. It operates uh, on a self-financing basis as an independent uh, statutory body. If we uh, take up the, 
the bill, the Hong Kong EAA would become a government subsidized body. This will affect uh, the position of Hong Kong EAA in the Hong Kong EAA ordinance and also the nature of Hong Kong EAA as a financially independent statutory body. And, uh, and th this is not really in relation to the long-term healthy growth of Hong Kong EAA, not quite beneficiary, not quite beneficial. If we want to support the candidates, uh, actually annually, the, depending on the needs, uh, we are providing sufficient assistance in the future for SEN students and the related uh, subsidy, we would uh, simplify the procedure. I believe uh, by doing this, uh, we can uh, help uh, those who are really in need uh, precisely and, uh, to, and to the point. Uh, Mrs. Regina Yip. President, I don't agree to the uh, across the board approach proposed to pay DSC examination fees for all candidates. This may result in waste. Resources should be deployed for the most for those in need. But secretary, we should uh, try to uh, compress or reduce the expenditure of Hong Kong EAA as far as possible. For example, WKCDA is facing a big deficit, and we should try to uh, reduce the expenditure as far as possible. And you have tried to streamline the examination arrangement. I know the Hong Kong EA also offer uh, practical examinations uh, with only 20 to 30 candidates. Perhaps uh, such examinations should be cancelled because uh, with more papers uh, and more examinations organized, the higher the cost. And also the, uh, the, the uh, fees uh, asked for reviewing examination results are very expenditure. Uh, Secretary, you should try to ask them to reduce their expenditure because uh, with a dwindling student population, the deficit is going to be larger. We would uh, regularly review the curriculum and the cost of examination and the candidates uh, taking such examination. Uh, but at the same time, we, would, uh, we are committed to providing quality education, uh, education service. Hong Kong EA has been adopting positive measures to cut uh, expenditure and explore new revenues. We have uh, put, a, put a cap on the uh, staff numbers, uh, reduce overtime pay, reduce uh, rent uh, expenditure, uh, provided that uh, the quality of public examination will not be uh, compromised. Uh, we would uh, re uh, regularly review their manpower resources and also uh, other measures to reduce uh, exam costs. Question for the Honourable Lam Chan Singh. Thank you, President. The Hong Kong Observatory issued a total of 116 very hot weather warnings from 2015 to 2019. Last year alone, the number of very hot days even hit a record high of 54. On the other hand, the number of heat stroke related work injury cases registered at the Labor Department LD from 2013 to 2017 was 100. On preventing employees from suffering heat stroke at work, with the government informed this council one of the respective numbers of heat stroke-related work injury and FAG A2 cases registered at LD in each of the past three years. Two, given that the interdepartmental working group set up by the government conducted a review in 2020 on the improvement measures in respect of the remuneration packages and labour protection for non-skilled employees engaged by government service contractors. And it recommended in its review report that contractors be required to provide uniforms with dry fit properties for non-skilled employees engaging in outdoor work in summer and that measures on preventing heat strokes such as provision of suitable work arrangements and supply of cool potable water be included in the tender briefs as guidelines for good practice of the latest implementation situation of the reference recommendations and the current num total number of non-skilled employees who have benefited from such recommendations and free. 
as the high temperature labor protection measures implemented by the People's Government of Guangdong Province stipulate that where the temperature reaches above 37 degrees Celsius to below 39 degrees Celsius, the duration of outdoor work of employees at open areas shall not be more than six hours, and where the temperature reaches above 39 degrees Celsius, outdoor work at open areas shall be suspended. Whether the authorities will, by drawing reference from the reference practice, enact legislation on employees working outdoors under very hot weather including making it a statutory requirement for conducting the risk assessments as set out in the booklet Risk Assessment for the Prevention of Heat Stroke at Work, compiled by LD, as well as expressly specifying working hour limits and proportion of rest time for employees who work under very hot weather. If so, after details. If not, the reasons for that. Secretary for Labour and Welfare. President, having consulted the Revenue Department's my consolidated response to the member's question is set up below. One, the number of work injury cases related to heat strokes registered by the Labor Department's LD in the past three years, that is 2019, 2020, and 21, are 2012 and 22 respectively. The figure in 2021 is uh, provisional, as some cases are still under investigation. There were no fatalities in these cases. Two, the Labor and Welfare Bureau set up an interdepartmental working group in 2020 to review the improvement measures for both the remuneration packages and labour protection of non-skilled employees engaged by government service contractors, GSCs. The working group consisted of members from four departments that use more non-skilled employee services, such that is, the Food and Environmental Hygiene Departments, Leisure and Cultural Service Department, Housing Department and Government Property Agency. The working group submitted a report in January 2021 recommending further measures to improve the working environment and the remuneration packages of non-skilled employees. To prevent heat stroke at work in hot environment for non-skilled employees, the re report recommended 1. Where necessary, including clauses in service contracts tended on or after the 1st of April 2021, requiring GSCs to provide uniforms with dry fit properties to non-skilled employees engaged in outdoor work in summer. And two, incorporating heat stroke prevention measures promulgated by the LD into the tender documents as a good practice guideline. The measures include prevent, providing suitable work arrangements, making use of mechanical aids in work to reduce physical demands, scheduling regular bricks for employees to rest in cooler areas during very hot periods, and providing cool potable water for employees to drink at all times. The above four major procurement departments have been implementing the recommendations of the working group progressively from the 1st of April 2021 and suitably adding the recommended measures in the tender documents when renewing the service contracts. Currently, a total of 12,369 non-skilled employees benefit from the reference service contracts. As the contracts for employing non-skilled employees to provide services generally last for two to three years, the above four departments are expected to fully implement the relevant recommendations in 2024, and the total number of non-skilled employees benefiting from the arrangement will be more than 38,000 by then. 3. Heat stroke is caused by heat stress. The level of heat stress at work depends on many factors, apart from temperature. The factors also include humidity of the working environment, airflow, heat, radiation level, workload of employees, clothing worn by employees, and whether employees are accustomed to torrid environment, etc. The government therefore considers that it is not appropriate to regulate outdoor working hours and rest periods based solely on temperature. Taking into account that summer temperature in Hong Kong is getting higher and higher, employees who work outdoors do face a certain risk of heat stroke. The LD is actively considering formulating more detailed and specific guidelines based on Hong Kong heat index from the Hong Kong Observatory to require employers to take appropriate heat stroke prevention measures in extremely hot weather. The LD has always been concerned about the risk of heat stroke faced by outdoor workers. It launches a large-scale 
promotional campaign on heat stroke prevention every summer and promotes the importance of heat stroke prevention through various media and online platforms. Since last year, the LD and the Occupational Safety and Health Council have launched the Portable Waste Fan Sponsorship Scheme for Small and Medium Enterprises SMEs to provide subsidies to SMEs in industries with a higher risk of heat stroke to purchase waste fans. According to Section 6 of the Occupational Safety and Health Ordinance, cap, uh, employers are required to provide for or maintain plants and systems of work that are, so far as reasonably practicable, safe and without risks to health. Such requirements include the implementation of appropriate risk control measures at the workplace to protect employees from heat stroke while at work. To assist employers in fulfilling their duties, the LD has issued a guideline on risk assessment for the prevention of heat stroke at work, which details the various risk factors that should be considered when conducting risk assessments and recommends corresponding control measures for each risk factor. The LD conducts inspection and law enforcement to ensure that employers comply with these legal requirements, including checking whether employers have referred to the above-mentioned guideline to assess the relevant risk factors for heat stroke at work and take corresponding control measures as far as reasonably practicable to protect the health of employees. If our inspection reveals that an employer has failed to refer to the guideline to carry out the required risk assessment and take appropriate control measures, corresponding enforcement actions will be taken. Thank you, President. Ms. Lam Chanson. Thank you, President. Now, I had to attend uh, some of the celebration activities for the July 1st. So uh, in the end of June, I uh, took the uh, PCR test almost every day at mobile um, stations set up by the government. These stations were uh, set up on uh, hard uh, uh, service football pitches. And uh, even if there are tents, you know, is and uh, and there are fans, is um, the the environment is stuffy. And uh, colleagues said that uh, the working condition is, was tough. So, in the reply, the government said that uh, there shouldn't be requirements uh, on the rest periods and uh, work hours for people. Now, in the next few months, that we will be seeing many very hot weather warnings. So, in the next few months, what more could the government do? to promote awareness uh, and so people will comply with the uh, risk assessment guidelines. Secretary, now we have already um, introduced the uh, guidelines on risk assessment for prevention of heat stroke at work uh, uh, for a long time. And you know, every year during the summer, of course, uh, that's the peak period and then we will use different channels to publicize the message. In the past, we've been using mostly conventional channels, but then in recent years, of course, there are many new media platforms. So we try to publicize the message for both employers and employees. And employers have to, say, follow the guidelines, such as the temperature, humidity, the uh, um, um, workflow and so on, so, and, and, and so employers will do the risk assessment. It's been working well, and then many we encourage employers to make use of the risk assessment form so that uh, uh, their workers can still carry that work um, um, under the uh, heat. And then, in and also, the Labor Department has been carrying out um, enforcement action in uh, 2021. We've uh, conducted some 26,000 inspections. Uh, um, we would uh, issue warnings or even take up prosecution in serious cases. Thank you. Mr. Charles Yu Chung. Thank you, President. In the reply, the Secretary said that well, we shouldn't just um, regulate outdoor working hours and rest periods based solely on temperature. But temperature is an objective accurate and straightforward index that everyone could understand. You know, when the temperature is high, uh, when employers see the temperature is high, they could make immediate arrangements for the, their outdoor workers. And then we could um, effectively reduce the cases of uh, workers you know, suffering from heat stroke. 
the government said this cannot be the only factor relied upon. Uh, there are many other factors to consider as well. But then, you know, as I as mentioned on the mainland, they just look at the temperature and then employees will have to arrange a rest periods uh, for workers. You know, the worst period, rest periods would, would not affect um, the work arrangement for the employers because we're just talking about short breaks. So, Secretary, would you do a bit more here? You say you have to, we have to consider a um, number of factors, I agree, but then you know, we have to see under what circumstances we could uh, require rest periods uh, for outdoor workers to minimize the chance of a uh, heat stroke. Secretary, I would like to thank Mr. Charles Yu Chung for his question. Yes, it's true. If you look around the world and see measures taken to prevent a heat stroke, each country will have regard to his, his own situation in making the necessary arrangement. And we note that in Guangdong province, they have uh, the arrangement that is, if the temperature is above 35, 39 degrees Celsius, there would be certain arrangement. So their approach is different from ours. Uh, for us, we look at a, ser uh, a series of indexes. Because, you know, scientifically, temperature uh, is not the only factor. Humidity is important, heat radiation, the kind of clothing, and whether um, the w work uh, is physically demanding and so on. There are other factors to consider other than temperature to see if there's a chance of heat stroke. Of course, uh, um, it's good to have a series of uh, fact uh, indexes, but perhaps we'll get more specific. That's why in the main reply, I said that we are actively looking at um, the situation. We may have regard to the Hong Kong heat index from the Hong Kong Observatory. And then we could then formulate uh, more detailed and specific guidelines. So then there will be even more objective um, consideration uh, to make sure the employers and employees are both protected. Thank you. Question 5, Edward Lum. Thank you, President. It is learned that as early as uh, 20, in 2003, one of the country's first astronauts sent into space visited Hong Kong. Quite a number of Hong Kong youths uh, were inspired and embraced uh, the aspiration of becoming an astronaut. In June last year, a chief designer of the country's manned space program indicated that Hong Kong citizens were welcome to participate in the manned space program and that technical preparation had been completed for the selection of astronauts in Hong Kong. In this connection, will the government inform this council one in respect of an day Blame Hong Kong citizens to participate in the country's manned space program. Whether the government has discussed or will discuss with the relevant departments on the mainland um, on the selection of astronauts in Hong Kong for receiving training or working on the mainland too, or the policies and measures in place for enabling Hong Kong youth to aspire to be involved in manned space program to make early preparation for the development in this field and for providing them with relevant support. And three, as it is learned that the country's astronauts are raw military personnel, while currently Hong Kong citizens cannot join the army on the mainland, rendering them unable to become the country's astronauts, even though they may be talents uh, who have the ability to become astronauts, whether the government will conduct discussion with the mainland authorities on allowing Hong Kong rules who meet the requirements to join the army so that they may ad advance towards their uh, space exploration. Secretary for Constitutional and Mainland Affairs. President, um, the continuous efforts of the country is breaking new ground in aerospace technology in recent years have consolidated in this leading position in the global aerospace arena and made Chinese people all over the world proud. Last year, three astronauts returned to Earth safely after a three-month-long stay in space and have successfully completed the first crewed mission for space station construction of the country's manned space program. In June this year, the launch of um, the manned uh, Shenzhou 14 spacecraft uh, was a complete success, and the three astronauts began a six-month stay in orbit. In June last year, an aerospace technology delegation, including a number of eminent scientists, was arranged by the country to visit Hong Kong during their stay in the country. They visited a number of schools to speak with students on the development journey and the latest situation of the country's astronomic, ast astronautical endeavours. They also brought with them lunar soil samples collected from the moon by the country last year for public display, display in Hong Kong for the first time, allowing Hong Kong people to share the country's distinguished aerospace achievements. In September last year, several Hong Kong scientific researchers and students had an invaluable opportunity to have a real-time 
online chat with the three astronauts while they were in space. The astronauts cordially answered the questions raised by the students at the activity venue. The event received um, an overwhelming response from the community. These invaluable activities are testimony to the care and support of the country for Hong Kong, and they have inspired many Hong Kong students in aerospace and other scientific fields. Having consulted uh, the Innovation, Technology and Industry Bureau, the Education Bureau and the Security Bureau, the consolidated reply to the question raised by Mr. Edward Leung is set up below. The government has been continuously promoting STEM, science, that is science, technology, engineering and mathematics, and STEAM, that is science, technology, engineering, arts and mathematics education at schools, so as to enhance students' interest in science and technology. While the science subject curriculum of junior secondary education covers basic scientific knowledge of space navigation, the physics subject curriculum of senior secondary education has an elective unit on astronomy and aerospace science. We also suggest schools organizing life-wide learning activities, including visit to the Hong Kong Space Museum to enrich students' learning in aerospace technology. Also, several local universities provide aerospace courses. Moreover, Hong Kong possesses strong capabilities in research and development, with five universities at the world's top 100. These are solid foundations for cultivating young people to participate in innovation and technology careers, including aerospace industry. We will continue to press ahead related work in the future. Although the country's astronauts who have participated or are particip participating in a manned space program are all from the background of Air Force pilots, we understand that uh, besides Air Force pilots, some of the 18 astronauts of the third batch selected in 2020 are professionals of other streams, mm. such as uh, scientists and engineers of uh, research institutes, specialists of research units, etc. They are now undergoing relevant training. In fact, Hong Kong has been participating in the aerospace industry of the country. For example, the um, Hong Kong Polytechnic team developed um, this service sampling and packing system, and um, they have assisted uh, Chang'e 5 uh, in completing the lunar sample return mission. Besides, um, the Mars Landing Surveillance Camera has, camera has provided support uh, to Mars Landing of uh, Tianwen 1. Over the years, the government has been nurturing innovation and technology talents, encouraging the implementation of popular science education at schools, and strengthening the students' knowledge in and application of information technology outside curriculum. On top of the regular curriculum, we launched the IT Innovation Lab in secondary schools and knowing more about IT program to subsidize primary and secondary schools to organize information technology related extracurricular activities and the STEM internship scheme to subsidize universities to arrange short term internship for the students taking STEM related programs with a view to fostering their interest in pursuing careers in IT in future and nurturing more IT talents for Hong Kong and the country. Moreover, to attract more outstanding international research talents to work in Hong Kong, we launched the Global STEM Professorship in June 2021, which provides funding for the universities to recruit internationally renowned IT scholars and their teams to take up teaching or research work in Hong Kong with a view to expanding the local INT talent pool. Besides, the Hong Kong Space Museum has organized since 2009 the Young Astronaut Training Camp to select around 30 local secondary school students during summer holidays each time to undergo astronaut training program in Beijing, Jiuquan, etc., at which, uh, which included undergoing simulated astronaut training, meeting with aerospace specialists and astronauts, etc., in order to understand the achievements of aerospace technology of the country. President, the aerospace industry of a country 
is developing rapidly. Hong Kong possesses outstanding R&D capabilities and a university team which takes part in space exploration projects. The government will actively press ahead the development of IT in Hong Kong and, at the same time, support various institutions participating in aerospace and technology projects of the country with a view to contributing to building the country into one which is strong in science and technology. Mr. Edward Lang. Thank you, President. Uh, well, our country's uh, aerospace technology is developing in leaps and bounds, and uh, we have actually got um, Shenzhou 14. And uh, when it comes to Shenzhou 14, well, astronauts yesterday um, actually gave an interview to the People's Daily yesterday, and they gave uh, a very important message that is that uh, they sincerely invi invited Hong Kong citizens to join the country's uh, aerospace development, and this year is the 25th anniversary of our return to the motherland. And therefore, for young people aspiring to become astronauts, can there be some good news? Astronauts. Uh, 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 Secretary. Well, um, thank you um, for your further question. As I said in the main reply, in fact, the government has all along attached a lot of importance to INT development in Hong Kong. And under the 14 five-year plan, in terms of our positioning in our country's development, we have also uh, aspired to become the INT center of our country. And when it comes to um, nurturing of talents, in particular, nurturing of uh, our youth talents, well, when President Xi uh, gave a speech um, at the um, uh, inauguration ceremony for the new term of government, he already said that uh, youth uh, are the pillars of our society, and therefore, in terms of IT training for our youth, we do attach a lot of importance to that. As I said, there were curriculum development and also extracurricular activities to nurture these talents. And in terms of INT, uh, there are a number of initiatives that are underway. And if um, um, you're interested, I can invite the bureau head to, to explain the details to you. But then our main task is to enhance the youth's interest um, in INT, and uh, that would include uh, aerospace, that's part of it. And um, as the ambient environment of our community uh, improves, and also if we are able to provide a suitable platform under our curriculum, then their knowledge and also their specialty and um, their experience will accumulate, then I'm sure in the INT area, including aerospace technology, I'm sure they'll be able to make a contribution to our country's um, aerospace mission. Secretary for Innovation uh, and uh, mm -hmm. Technology and Industry, I'd like to thank Mr. Edward Young for his question. Well, as the Secretary just said, uh, in recent years, uh, we have more and more young people who are interested um, in aerospace technology. And um, in the past, um, we have done a lot of uh, education. And um, for example, in 2016, the HAB and also the, um, the um, officer on the mainland uh, worked together. And uh, we have also got this program on manned mission uh, of a country. And uh, as a result, uh, they went to uh, Jiuquan and they paid a visit uh, to the Space Center there. And uh, in recent years, as you said, uh, we also jointly run the, um, the um, uh, spirit of the era. And then uh, there was a direct uh, chat uh, between Hong Kong students and also the, uh, the astronauts um, um, on, on, in space. And uh, they were able to write directly to the astronauts in space. And uh, there was strong message expressed uh, to the astronauts. Uh, and they also managed to get direct replies uh, from those um, astronauts. So that shows that uh, they are very, they are taking pride uh, in the achievements of our country. And in recent years, we have also done a lot. Uh, for example, our Polytechnic University and also the HKUST in recent years have also arranged uh, for programs um, uh, related uh, to aerospace technology. At present, there are three universities in Hong Kong, and every year, no less than 100 students would be able to focus on aerospace technology. Thank you. Uh, yes, uh, Mr. Ken Kenneth Leung. Well, President, I think young people should be involved um, in the uh, major missions of our country, and that would also enhance uh, their sense of um, uh, identity. Because um, Hong Kong 
students uh, have fewer opportunities to be directly involved um, in aerospace mission. And uh, taking advantage of aerospace technology development, that would be a very good opportunity for us uh, to get involved. And therefore, I'd like to know whether or not we would make, take advantage of the success that we have achieved uh, so far. How can we enhance the uh, sense of pride and sense of identity of our young people in our country? Secretary for uh, Constitutional and Mainland Affairs. Thank you, President, um, for the question. Well, as I said in the main reply, all along, we attach a lot of importance uh, to young people's development, in particular in the area of uh, innovation and technology. And of course, uh, when it comes to innovation and technology, aerospace technology is um, an indicator of the consolidated strength of our country. And uh, with the rapid development in aerospace development as a Chinese national, our sense of our belonging and sense of pride and sense of identity, uh, sense of identity have been enhanced. Uh, that's precisely the reason why last year, after the completion of the mission, we immediately arranged for the um, aerospace technology delegation to visit Hong Kong so that we can take advantage of such activities to inspire the students so that uh, they will have greater interest um, in INT as well as uh, aerospace technology. And we will continue with that effort. Uh, other than doing that uh, in the uh, school curriculum, we will offer appropriate programs to enhance the uh, students' um, interest and knowledge. And we will also be creating the right environment conducive uh, to the young people's uh, development in these areas. So that uh, that would be the uh, point uh, where they can um, um, uh, gain access uh, to these areas. Mrs. Regina Ip, President, uh, can I ask uh, one of the Bureau Directors to explain to us in simple terms, that is, um, well, for uh, non-military Hong Kong citizens, if they're interested in aerospace activities to really travel to space, whether in terms of their physical ability, uh, age, and also um, their knowledge area, um, how can they be qualified? And also, will you also assist the central authorities in selecting the right uh, uh, members of the community so that they can also join in such missions? Secretary. Yes, thank you, Mrs. Ip, for your question. Well, as we said, right now, for the selection of astronauts, uh, well, during the first two batches uh, selection, mostly um, they had the background of being Air Force pilots. But then in the third batch, uh, you can see that uh, there are already, already um, uh, people uh, from a non-Air Force background. For example, we have scientists and engineers of our research institutes are uh, being selected. So in terms of the uh, avenues available with the advancement in aerospace technology, uh, more disciplines, uh, experts uh, are also able to join in that mission. And in this regard, we will also collaborate uh, closely with our mainland counterparts. We have uh, emphasized uh, repeatedly that uh, in terms of innovation and technology, we will continue to deepen our collaboration with our mainland counterparts. Uh, and um, in the area of innovation and technology, aerospace technology is part of it. And therefore, in our future collaboration and exchange, we will try to adopt a multi-pronged approach so that there would be diversified collaboration and where necessary. We will also take it up with the central authorities and um, we will reflect to them that uh, there are opportunities that we can take up so that we can also refine such opportunities. As far as the current requirements uh, are concerned, uh, we don't really uh, fully understand the requirements because uh, for the um, selection criteria, I'm sure Mrs. Yip would understand. They have not disclosed uh, the full details uh, of the criteria in the selection process. In the future, with the deepening of collaboration between us, uh, I'm sure we will be able to get hold of more information and I'll disclose that in due course. Um, Kenneth Wong, thank you, um, President. Well, in the government's uh, main reply, I noticed that arrangements were made for Hong Kong students uh, to visit uh, Be uh, Beijing and Jiuquan, to visit um, um, the um, astronaut training facilities and so on. So I'd like to know, well, in uh, Wenchang in Hainan, 
the central authorities have also set up a sizable uh, satellite um, um, space. And in fact, um, well, um, recently I also went to um, uh, Wenchang in Hainan. I also saw the uh, Changzheng one. And um, um, on the same day, well, um, a Baptist University team was also there. So I hope that you can attach some more importance to Hong Kong University teams participating in aerospace development in our country. And afterwards, some um, their achievements can also be uh, promoted among students of Hong Kong. So I hope that you can consider that. Thank you, President, and thank you, Dr. Kenneth Wong for your uh, Kennedy Wong for your very su constructive suggestion. Yes, we will pass on your comment to the organizer. So that um, when they make adjustments uh, to the arrangements, uh, they can um, uh, refine the details so that uh, they can also enhance the results. Uh, maybe I can also invite the secretary uh, to um, speak a bit more on this. Yes, thank you. In fact, uh, targeting our universities and also uh, for research uh, funding for uh, aerospace technology that has been increasing, for example, through the ITF, um, there were six projects being supported. And uh, many of them have to do with aerospace technology, for example, uh, raw material science uh, and uh, electronics and so on. We do encourage uh, research teams in the universities of Hong Kong to collaborate uh, with our mainland teams, because that's also part of the integration process with our country. And as uh, we just said a couple of years ago, we also introduced this program on um, having access uh, to science. Uh, well, we would try to reach out to overseas uh, professionals uh, and uh, researchers. So that is the global STEM professorship, so that uh, they would be recruited and come back to Hong Kong. And uh, many Hong Kong universities are also establishing their own curriculum. And therefore, we are actually attracting more and more such talents to come to Hong Kong. And in a few years' time, I'm sure, Hong Kong's aerospace uh, studies uh, will, de will develop rapidly, and um, that would also include more exchanges. And um, well, research students and also university students would also have a chance to have more contacts. Uh, and I'm sure we will also contact our counterparts on the mainland, and uh, our researchers uh, in the universities would also uh, take the students uh, to Jiuquan and uh, Beijing and other places in, Hong in uh, China to visit them. Yes, Mr. Ma Fong Kuo. Thank you, President. I'd like to ask uh, about uh, part three of the question. If uh, Hong Kong students would like to take part um, in aerospace missions, uh, they might have to have a military background. But then, well, for many Hong Kong young people, many of them are willing to consider joining the um, military of our country so that they can also be the defenders uh, of our uh, national security. I think uh, in a country, that's uh, the obligation of the, the youth. And indeed, uh, that is also the aspiration of many Hong Kong young people. But then uh, the SL government has yet to make such arrangements to enable Hong Kong young people to join the army in whatever form so that they be able to get involved uh, in the work of uh, the military so that they can defend our country. They can also acquire knowledge of high technology and be involved uh, in research and development projects like this. So I'd like to ask the SAL government, do you have any intention or consideration to meet the aspiration of our youth are to be uh, loyal to our country because they'd like to be the defenders of our country's security? And at the same time, we can also nurture many young talents uh, so that uh, they can also uh, have a chance uh, to uh, develop their skills uh, in, S in aerospace technology. Thank you, President, and thank you, Mr. Ma, for your question. First, uh, in accordance with the Army law um, of our country, there is no requirement for Hong Kong young people to be drafted into the Army. And if um, Hong Kong young people would like to display their loyalty to our country, I'm sure there are many channels available. Well, in different um, positions, 
people um, if they are patriots to our country so long as they can hang on to such a um, uh, uh, mindset um, if they have a sense of uh, identity sense of belonging and sense of pride to our country then I'm sure they will be able to make contribution to our country thank you last question requiring an oral reply Dr. Kenny Wong President, it has been reported that on the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to the motherland, the government advertised through the Hong Kong Economic and Trade Office CTO in Brussels, Belgium, on trams in Brussels to celebrate Hong Kong's return to the motherland. Although the content of the advertisement has had been passed by the local transport company and the outsourced advertising contractor concerned, the advertisement was eventually pulled by the tram company due to the complaints from a group of anti-China netizens. In this connection with the government informed this council, one, whether similar incidents have occurred recently when other overseas CTOs of the government are carrying out uh, promotional work on celebrating Hong Kong's return to the motherland. If so, how the authorities follow up such incidents. Two, whether in the light of the aforesaid uh, incident, the government has assessed the difficulties that it may encounter in its work on publicizing and promoting Hong Kong in future, and how it would deal with such difficulties, and three, of its plans to introduce in detail the actual situation of the 25th anniversary of Hong Kong's return to the motherland and the successful implementation of one country, two systems in Hong Kong to international partners of Hong Kong through its overseas CTOs, and whether it will formulate key performance indicators for the relevant promotional work, if so, of the details. If not, the reasons for that. Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development. President, the 25th anniversary of the establishment of Hong Kong SAR of the People's Republic of China is an important milestone for our country and Hong Kong SAR. Under the theme A New Era, Stability, Prosperity, Opportunity, the Hong Kong SAR government has organized a a series of promotional events around the world signaling Hong Kong's new chapter of governance and prosperity and the Hong Kong will endeavour to integrate into the overall development of our country, proactively aligning with a national development strategies such as the 14th five-year plan, the development of Greater Bay Area GPA and high-quality development under the Belt and Road Initiative. As the overseas official representative of Hong Kong SAR government, the 14 overseas Hong Kong Economic and Trade Officers, ETOs, have partnered with government departments and agencies, including the Information Services Department, Invest Hong Kong, Hong Kong Trade Deve Development Council, and the Hong Kong Tourism Board, as well as uh, Chambers of Commerce and Professional Bodies, to organize over 160 events. These events com uh, comprise Hong Kong Month, Hong Kong Week, seminars on the Bell and Road Initiative and the CPA, and art and cultural performances, roving exhibition, dragon boat races, food festival, etc., showcasing Hong Kong's efforts and achievements in the past 25 years, and fostering confidence and hope across all sectors overseas to join me, welcome a new era. As regards the three parts of the question raised by Honourable Kenneth Wong, uh, my reply is uh, as follows. In celebration 1 and 2, in celebration of the 25th anniversary of the establishment of Hong Kong ICR, Brussels CTO has organized 14 events, including Hong Kong Month in Europe. In June this year, Brussels CTO launched a publicity campaign theme, Hong Kong is moving ahead. Hong Kong trams in Europe in Brussels, Istanbul, Lisbon, and Milan, spreading the news of the 25th anniversary of the establishment of Hong Kong SAR across Europe. Furthermore, in line with the promotions of the 15th and the 5th, 20th anniversaries of the establishment of Hong Kong SAR, Brussels CTO planned to dress Medicon P, the Brussels tourism attraction, in his Hong Kong costume previously donated to the local city government. Throughout the planning of these two events, Brussels CTO have maintained close communication with the relevant public transport authority and the city government. The government expresses regret and disappointment over the decision of the relevant institutions to withdraw from the promotional events. As a matter of fact, the tram publicity campaign was successfully held in Istanbul, Lisbon, and Milan. Moreover, Gala receptions hosted by Brussels CTO for the 25th anniversary celebration in Brussels, Dublin, The Hague, Lisbon, and Milan were warmly received. 
and the reception come exhibition on the West Kowloon Cultural District held in Paris was favorably reviewed by international travel news media. The DHSL government expresses gratitude to all sectors for their support in these events. In addition, with the support from all sectors, the gala dinner in Toronto and the art exhibition in Richmond were successfully successfully organized by Toronto ETO for the celebration of the 25th uh, anniversary. Despite nuisances caused by a small number of protest protesters, the government requests that certain individuals cause nuisances to the celebration. These were isolated incidents. ETOs should uh, shoulder the responsibility ETOs are shoulder the responsibility of promoting Hong Kong overseas and will continue to perform their duties with perseverance, sparing no effort in enhancing Hong Kong's international reputation and sharing the joy of celebrating the 25th anniversary of the establishment of Hong Kong SAR with communities worldwide. In fact, at the end of June, ETOs have successfully hosted over 50 celebration events for the 25th anniversary, including the Hong Kong Through the Open Glass, Miniature Art Exhibition, the Hong Kong Story Youth Competition, the Dragon Boat Race Festival, and the Reception for International Students from Hong Kong, etc., receiving positive feedback and support across all sectors. For example, in May this year, the then Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development officiated the open, opening ceremony of roofing exhibition and attended a business luncheon with more than 100 participants from the com business community for the celebration of the 25th anniversary in Bangkok, Thailand. In June, the Minister of Trade and of Indonesia in delivered a speech at a business conference at a business conference hosted by Jakarta ETO to celebrate the 25th anniversary, and it was attended by around 240 members of the local pol political and business sectors, exemplifying the close relationship between the two places. Furthermore, ETOs have organized celebration banquets and receptions in various cities, with participation by the local Chinese councils, journal, and members of the political, business, and academic communities. ETOs have been providing updates on Hong Kong's latest situation to stakeholders from different sectors, including members of political, business, and academic communities, think tanks, me and media outlets actively promoting the successful implementation of one country, two systems, Hong Kong's new chapter of governance and prosperity following the enactment of national security law and pages administering Hong Kong, as well as Hong Kong's important role under national development strategy, such as the 14 five-year plan, the Bend Road Initiative, and the high-quality GBA development attracting investment and discovering more collaboration opportunities. Through organizing various celebration events for the 25th anniversary, ETOs have uh, deepened collaboration with overseas stakeholders and promoted the achievement of Hong Kong as an East and East West Center for International Cultural Exchange. The external promotion of Hong Kong is part of the regular duties of ETOs. The performance indicators of the operation of ETOs have been listed under the relevant heads of the controller officer's report in the budget, including resources allocated by allocated to the ETOs policy objectives, event descriptions, etc. The key performance indicators for evaluating the services of ETOs include a number of calls on senior government officials or organizations, seminars, ex exhibitions, workshops, and promotional activities organized and participated, News newsletters, pamphlets, and press releases issued, and public speeches and uh, media interviews or briefings given. In line with relevant policy objectives, ETO would ensure proper utilization of resources and assist policy bureaus in performing the duties of external promotion and liaison effectively. Thank you, President. Dr. Kenneth Wong. President, I thank the Secretary for Commerce and Economic Development for a very detailed reply. I would like to follow up uh, to on Two points. We have 14 ETOs, overseas ETO, in different areas, in different regions. They, these, uh, area, these regions may serve different uh, strategic in purposes for Hong Kong in the coming years. How can you ensure that these ETOs can do a better job? Well, you have asked a, a supplementary question. Uh, let me invite the Secretary to reply. Secretary, thank you for your question. Since I assume office, I, would, uh, I have been uh, conducting weekly meetings with uh, all the ETOs uh, by region, and then uh, we, uh, we have discussed uh, the work plan for the next 
half of the year. And we also talk about the, the speech given by President Xi Jinping about, uh, about the success of one country, two systems, our free economy, our legal system, and our advantages as a trade center, and also our uh, advantages in the East, Midwest West uh, cult cultural exchange, and how we can uh, leverage on such efforts in our promotion and publicity work. And also, we talk about the uh, objectives and uh, policies for the next, for the promotional work of the ETO. All, all the uh, ETOs uh, would uh, share common goals and objectives in promoting Hong Kong's trade development. Uh, Dr. Tan Yue Hung, thank you, President. Uh, the, so, this the, the topic is promoting Hong Kong. We have 14 ETOs. Apart from these, we have uh, 16 uh, offices or liaison offices in the mainland. So we will be doing promotion both over in overseas countries and uh, in the mainland. With altogether, we have 13 such uh, ETO offices, which would uh, serve similar purposes. Although mainland uh, ETOs uh, are not are not guided by the uh, C S C E D B, but do you have uh, any uh, unified uh, systematic uh, promotional plan for all these uh, overseas offices? If not, uh, perhaps uh, you should consider adopting a consistent approach for all these uh, office overseas offices. Uh, thank you for the question. Although mainland. Uh, Offices are not under the CEDP, uh, but uh, these offices uh, have um, served multiple purposes, not just trade, and they would uh, carry out duties uh, in line with the particular bureau's uh, policies. We have mainland uh, trade offices, and also together with the Trade Development Council and Invest Hong Kong, we have collaboration projects. We would promote Hong Kong's uh, trade and economic uh, investment in with uh, TTC. We have 65 uh, offices, uh, including those of uh, invest from US Hong Kong in 228 uh, countries, where they organize uh, meetings, seminars, and promotional uh, sessions, so that we can be integrated in the, the country's development and the dual uh, circulation economic uh, program. Uh, and we also uh, facilitate uh, the going out uh, strategy of mainland enterprises. We have adopted a promotional strategy uh, because of the epidemic. Many planned activities are, are not yet rolled out. But uh, despite the uh, pandemic, I will be trying to visit different countries to, to do my part to contribute to the economic development of Hong Kong. And uh, we, I will be willing to discuss with uh, cooperation plans with uh, my counterparts. I'm going to uh, Thailand in, uh, later this year. And uh, I will be attending the uh, in September the uh, APEC meeting with the CE. And uh, I will be doing all this to promote uh, trade and uh, investment in Hong Kong. Mrs. Regina Yip, I'm glad to learn from the Secretary that, uh, that uh, the nuisances uh, experienced uh, by our ETOs in Brussels and uh, Vancouver are isolated incidents. Uh, these activities are good in promoting Hong Kong. Uh, they, uh, Information Services Department has uh, engaged a consultant, costing us uh, tens of millions of dollars in promoting uh, Hong Kong. And uh, it's been re reported that, that Hong Kong ha is now seen in different lights by different countries in different regions. Or will the CEDB to come up with a thematic uh, activities to attract the attention? of uh, their people. Of course, uh, politicians uh, have their biases, but we are not just targeting politicians. We are facing to the uh, communities there. So how, how are we going to go about it? 
Thank you for your comments, uh, Mrs. Uh, Yip. Uh, that's why I've uh, talked to the ETOs uh, region by region, and I've been talking about the, f uh, the focal points of different ETOs. So these meetings are, are not conducted with all the ETOs at the same time. And then uh, we would uh, finalize the work program for the latter half of the year. And through our consultants, we would uh, un try to understand the special features of different uh, countries. For Europe, well, we we would uh, focus on uh, Central Asia emerging markets in Central Asia and uh, Islamic countries and their needs. We will adopt a targeted approach. Uh, we will make suitable arrangements, organize suitable activities for different uh, regions. Well, we would uh, take on board uh, the, the suggestions from the member. Mr. Tommy Zhang, my question is this, Secretary. In uh, overseas countries, Many uh, chambers of commerce and, and uh, people and individuals and, and scholars have give, given speeches that uh, tend to smear Hong Kong. So are you going to do this or have you done this? And uh, have you uh, turned your attention to these countries where we, we have experienced uh, such a uh, smearing activities. So perhaps you can inform us of uh, what they have been doing so that we can uh, do our part in preventing the, the dissemination of false information and the smearing campaign against um, Hong Kong and our country. Thank you for your question. In the ETOs, uh, in all the ETOs, they would pay attention to local media and the uh, publication of uh, incorrect information on Hong Kong, and they will respond accordingly. And they have already written to different media to explain the situation in Hong Kong. And since June 2022, when, when we uh, have the national security law, we have uh, the ETOs have uh, issued more than a thousand emails and letters to different media to explain the uh, economic and investment situation in Hong Kong. And we have also issued uh, situational papers to CE and other principal officials so that they can explain the situation in Hong Kong when they make speeches. And there's a, a new report on Hong Kong's uh, business environment. Our ETOs have been able to that, give the report to all stakeholders and explain to them the overall business environment in Hong Kong. After the uh, improvement to our electoral system, the Central People's Government has also issued a white paper on Hong Kong's uh, freedom and uh, law of law. And our ETOs have also made use of this uh, white paper to explain to stakeholders that, uh, that the new opportunities and the system systematic uh, foundation of our uh, business environment. And uh, they, they, they will also provide reports and um, response to, appro to their situation appropriately, and also to remind different bureaus of uh, matters of concern that they should uh, pay special attention to. Well, is your question not answered? Well, the Secretary has not uh, looked answer my question as regards uh, whether you would uh, assess uh, speeches given by chambers of commerce or universities. Have you done that? Well, this is a very, very question. The ETOs uh, is in constant uh, communication with uh, the business community, scholars and uh, schools and universities. Uh, there will be a regular uh, briefing sessions, and we will, they will also make use of different uh, platform in the community, and then we will disseminate our information and uh, full pictures and paper, 
and we also pay attention to the messages uh, expressed through such media so, so as to understand the local uh, situation and comments on Hong Kong. Uh, Mr. Houghton Chow, this is uh, disappointing uh, in regard to this uh, Brussels uh, incident, incident. In order not to give people the false impression that uh, we would withdraw once uh, they threaten us. So are you going to do, do it again, to do the advertisement again in Brussels to, to celebrate the 25th anniversary? So would there be more work done in that regard? As I've said, the EDO would uh, persevere and move forward in publicizing Hong Kong's overall situation. Uh, although the Brussels incident is an isolated incident, but the TTO would uh, try to find other opportunities to uh, disseminate information on our business environment. So we will try to do it again so that citizens of uh, and the government of Brussels will understand Hong Kong and then we can uh, improve things gradually. Dr. Kenneth Wong. Uh, uh, my question for the Secretary is that uh, our, whether our ETOs uh, would uh, liaise with our uh, countries, uh, councillors and embassies regularly it's in, in uh, Co or cooperation uh, programs? If not, uh, would that be done in the future? Under the one country, two system principle, our ETOs uh, work uh, independently, but there's a close uh, communication. They would attend each other's uh, programs, such as seminars, meetings, and uh, cultural uh, activities. And uh, given suitable uh, opportunities, uh, our ETO will seek the, the help of uh, uh, our Embassies and consulates. Thank you. Paul. Government bills. This